Lord Jesus Christ, we need your truth. There are so many ideas and opinions and lies swirling throughout the world, masquerading as the truth. And Lord, we ask that you would reveal those, take them away, so that we can see you clearly today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In 2018, when Oprah Winfrey received her Golden Globe Award, she stood up and gave her acceptance speech, and she preached this message to the masses. She said, speak your truth. And what she and many people mean by that is, hey, it's okay not to live in the dark anymore. It's okay to talk about your experience, your, your point of view, where you come from, even the trauma that you may have gone through in your life. In reality, it's not bad advice. Um, in, in the sense that a lot of mental health issues stem from hiding in the darkness of shame, of guilt and fear, and not sharing your experience, your reality with other people. The problem, though, that this statement has caused is that right now, it's speak your truth has not only uh, meant to talk about your own personal experiences, but now it's morphed into this idea of that your truth can be absolute truth. That what you personally believe about life, about morality, about God, should be for everybody else what they should believe. Or it's taken on this, this wiggliness, if I can say it that way, of, of getting out of being held accountable. Because your truth is your truth, my truth is my truth, and therefore, I can't judge you and you can't judge me. It seems like a great way to live your life. It seems like a great way to keep the peace. But think about this. If your truth is the truth and my truth is the truth, is there such a thing as a lie? Interesting thought. And we all know that there are lies. Lies hurt. Lies divide. We've all told lies. I've told lies. You've told lies. We've all been lied to, and it's worse when it's somebody who we love. Parents have lied to children. Pastors have lied to congregations. Politicians have lied to their constituents. So where do you find truth? Sometimes you go to a friend's house, you're talking, and you ask a question, and nobody knows the answer, and what do you say? You pull out your phone and you say, say it with me, Google it, right? Or you ask Siri, I'm going to let you in on a secret, though. Not everything on the internet is truth. It's not. There's a lot of opinions, a lot of ideas, a lot of lies promoting themselves as truth, as fact. Yeah. And so this leads us to the question that a career politician who lived 2,000 years ago named Pontius Pilate asked one day, he asked this question, what is truth? What is truth? Because if absolute truth cannot be found by watching the evening news or C-SPAN or asking Siri or Googling it, where do you turn? And today in our lesson, Jesus Christ is going to make the bold claim that he is the truth, that he is on the side of truth and anyone who listens to him will embrace his truth. And he says, I can back it up. Now today, we're, our, our lesson is gonna start on Palm Sunday. Today is historically called Palm Sunday. This is the day that Jesus triumphantly rode into Jerusalem on a donkey uh, amidst cries and shouts from the people. Uh, just imagine you're at, uh, I know it hasn't happened in a while, but imagine the last big 4th of July parade you, you were at where all the people were packed in and they're shouting and cheering and clapping and singing. That's what's going on here. And then people are taking off their cloaks and putting them along the road. They're cutting down palm branches and putting that on the street. In essence, what they're doing is rolling out the red carpet for Jesus. And then they're shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna to the son of David. It's this Hebrew word that means save us, but in their context, it was a word of praise. And so what's happening here is this is a Jesus kingly procession. But now fast forward five days and the parade is over. 
People are, have already picked up their cloaks and washed them. All those palm branches are now mixing in with the mud and becoming one with the street. And King Jesus is no longer being treated like a king. That Thursday evening, he was betrayed into the hands of the Jewish leaders. They took him and had this mock trial with the high priest standing there. It was a sleepless night for Jesus, full of baseless accusations and unprovoked beatings. And then finally, at the end of the evening, they came to a verdict, and they declared that Jesus Christ was guilty. Guilty of blasphemy. Blasphemy is the sin of calling yourself God or making yourself equal to God, and in the Jewish religion, it was punishable by death. And so that Friday morning, the Jews wanted to kill King Jesus. And that's where our lesson starts today in John chapter 18, verse 28. It says, early in the morning, the Jews led Jesus from Caiaphas, he's the high priest, to the praetorium. The praetorium was the governor's residence. This is where he lived and also did the business of governing. They did not enter the praetorium themselves so that they would not become ceremonially unclean. They wanted to be able to eat the Passover meal. So the governor was a Gentile. And Jewish rules said that you cannot associate or have contact with a Gentile without becoming ceremonially unclean. So they stood outside the praetorium, and now he's going to come out and stand on the portico or the balcony there. Um, and the reason they didn't want to have this association is because they did not want to be unclean so that they could take part in their favorite festival, the Passover meal. This is what happens. So Pilate went out to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? They answered him, if this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. So first off, uh, the governor, he wears multiple hats. He is also the judge for the community, and he wants to find out what charge are they bringing against Jesus. And their answer, I heard someone snicker, it's ridiculous, isn't it? If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Is that a, is that a charge? I mean, when I read that, they're like, well, this guy's a bad guy. You should punish him. So they, they have no, they're grasping for straws. They have no reason to bring Jesus before them. There's no basis for a trial, and yet they're trying to get him to be tried. So Pilate told them, take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews said, it's not legal for us to put anyone to death. That's a very important statement there. Did you ever notice that any time that the Pharisees tried to trap Jesus, there was always a trap between the Mosaic law, the religious laws, and the civil laws of the Romans? And a couple weeks ago in this series, we talked about John chapter 8, where Jesus is at the temple, he's teaching, he's bent down, he's writing on the ground, we don't know what he was writing, but in that moment, they brought in this woman who was caught in adultery, and they say, Moses declares that any such woman should be stoned to death. What do you say, Jesus? If he would have said, go for it, execute her, what would have happened is he would have broken the Roman civil law because the Jews had no right to put anyone to death. Now, most importantly is what comes next. It says this happened so that the statement Jesus had spoken indicating what kind of death he was going to die would be fulfilled. Today, I'm going to take you on a tour of the book of John. I'm going to quote all kinds of other verses that John writes for us. But John chapter 3, Jesus is talking with the Pharisee Nicodemus. And he tells him that the Son of Man, referring to himself, must be lifted up. Meaning he must be put up on a cross. Jews did not execute people in this way, but the Romans did. And Jesus had to be lifted up on this cross so that the world would see him. For the charges put against him, and, and the charges were the king of the Jews. That's it. And what's really interesting is that Jesus was in control the entire time. This was all part of the plan. John chapter 10, Jesus says, This is why the Father loves me. I'm talking about God the Father. Because I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own. 
I have the authority to lay it down, and I have the authority to take it up again. This is the commission I receive from my Father. Multiple times throughout John, Jesus was in these hairy situations where the, the Pharisees wanted to kill him. They either wanted to stone him to death or throw him off the cliff, and each time it says he just stepped out of the way. Slid out of the way. They couldn't do anything unless Jesus allowed them to. Jesus is in complete control of this scenario. It's all going according to plan. Back to John 18. Pilate went back into the praetorium and summoned Jesus. He asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, are you saying this on your own or did others tell you about me? I love Jesus for many reasons, but I would say 95% of the time somebody asks him a question and he responds with a question. <laughs> and for an interrogator, this is super annoying. So Pilate is, he's like, wait a second, I'm, I'm the one asking question here. What, what is Jesus doing? And again, Jesus is in complete control of the situation and, and he wants to get to the heart of matter with Pilate. Pilate, obviously frustrated, answered, am I a Jew? Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus replied, read this with me, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But now, read it, my kingdom is not from here. Pay very close attention to this because I... I think we either don't understand what Jesus is saying or we forget all too often. His early disciples and these massive crowds desperately wanted Jesus to be their king. They wanted him to be this political figure that would save them from the tyranny of the Romans that would bring them up out of their poverty and fill their pantries full of food. They wanted an earthly kingdom. And yet Jesus says, my kingdom is not from this world. You don't have to say it out loud, but I want you to do some introspection here and, and, and ask this, answer this question. Have you ever viewed Jesus in this way? Have you ever viewed Jesus, your king, as his job is to get you to the next class? From lower class to middle class to upper middle class to upper class. Have you ever viewed his job as to make your life easier by taking away all of your challenges, all the difficulties that you face? Have you ever seen Jesus' kingdom as, as, as this ideal that he's going to free us from the tyranny of one political party over the other? That, that Jesus is going to use our earthly kings or, or presidents or governors to usher in this equality and, and morality for all. Have you ever thought that way? Here's the thing. That is not Jesus' kingdom. It is not of this earth. It's not a political party. It's not associated with a particular political party. It's not a social welfare program. It's not a 501c3 nonprofit organization. It's not from here, and therefore it does not operate like an earthly kingdom or government. Jesus' kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. And the way that Jesus enacts change is not by overrunning governments. It's not at the national level. It's not through rules and policies. It's through him ruling in your hearts and minds, in my heart and mind. This is how Jesus and Acts change. And when you get this, when you believe this, this is what Jesus declares about his followers in John chapter 17. He says, they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Jesus does not want his followers, he doesn't want us thinking from a worldly point of view, but from a heavenly point of view. Realizing that our true citizenship is not where we have our passport or where we have our driver's license or where we reside, but our true citizenship is in heaven in this mansion that Jesus Christ has prepared for you and me. And this is what Jesus is declaring to Pilate. 
this earthly governor. But Pilate doesn't see it. Pilate is in interrogation mode. And this is what he says. You are a king then, Pilate asked. Jesus answered, I am, as you say, a king. For this reason I was born, and for this reason I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. There are a lot of competing voices out in the world saying that they have the truth. And yet here, Jesus boldly proclaims, declares that if you belong to the truth, you're going to listen to his voice, to what he says. Uh, Early on in John chapter 8, he says, if you remain in my word, you are really my disciples. You will also know the truth, and the truth will set you, say it with me, free. So this is what he means. He says, if you're a disciple, you're going to be in the word. You're going to study the word. You're going to meditate on it. You're going to pray over it. You're going to put it into practice. And by listening to the word of God, you're going to know the truth. And that truth is going to set you free from lies, from shame, from guilt, from sin. This is where he's going with this. And what I love about Jesus is that he also loves the skeptics. If you're a skeptic, if, if, you're, if you're listening to me right now, you're at home, you're here in person, and you're like, ah, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. If, if you're that person, Jesus extends to you an olive branch. And this is what he says in John chapter 7. I told you I was going to give you a tour of John, right? I'm all over the place today. Here you are, John 7. He says, anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. So what that means is take a test drive. Here's the keys, get in the car, drive it around. If you don't like it, money back guaranteed. He says, you try this, you live it out, and you're going to find out that I'm speaking the truth. It's one of those things where people say, a lifetime warranty, how can they guarantee that? Well, Jesus can guarantee that because he knows that what he's offering you will not fail, is not a lie, is the absolute truth. Because he is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the way, the truth, and the life as he declared so boldly. Again, Jesus says, everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Are you listening to Jesus' voice? Are you implementing what he says in his word? Are you living that out? Are you believing it? Or are you taking his words out of context? Do you read his word and you say, I like this, so I'm going to apply this to my life. I don't like that, so I'm not going to listen to that part. Are you trying to make Jesus' kingdom an earthly kingdom? Now, I want to be clear. It's true. God the Father wants us to have a positive influence upon our neighbors, our society, our communities. But to what end? Is it God's greatest desire that everyone of our nation become really good, moral, and upright citizens? I mean, it would be great if we were all nice to each other that we would all listen to each other's points of view and and nod our heads and smile, and that would be great. But here's the thing. Good people don't go to heaven. Moral people don't go to heaven. People who believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior go to heaven. Plain and simple. And so the Apostle Paul declares to us in 1 Timothy chapter 2, He says, God, our Savior, wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. And the truth is, Jesus Christ is our Savior. Jesus Christ came into this world to make us citizens of heavens. And when someone becomes a citizen of heaven, that's when they can work on their morality. That's what listening to Jesus' voice means. That's what the truth is. And this is what Jesus is Jesus wants everyone to be saved. He wants Pilate to be saved. He's declaring this truth in front of him. And yet, Pilate doesn't see it. Read that with me. What is truth? Jesus is right there. He just said, I am. 
And Pilate's still blinded by it. Pilate said to him, after he said this, he went out again to the Jews and he told them, I find no basis for a charge against him, but you have a custom that I release one prisoner to you at the Passover. So do you want me to release the king of the Jews for you? Then they shouted back, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a rebel. Pilate had dedicated his entire adult life to politics, to law and order. His personal truth, his personal experience that he had gleaned was that everybody had an agenda. The gospel writers, all four of them, all eyewitnesses, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, talk about Pilate, and Matthew tells us that Pilate's agenda in this whole scenario is he did not want to have a riot on his hands. Matthew also declares that Pilate recognized that the Jews didn't want justice. They were there because they were envious of Jesus and they just wanted to get their competition out of the way. And sadly, he had the embodiment of truth sitting right in front of him and he still asked the question, what is truth? Do you ever feel like Pilate Some of you are lifelong Christians. You've been going to church all the time. Watch online. You read your Bibles. You read your devotional books. And yet, do you feel caught in the middle of of wondering what's right and what's wrong? Who's speaking truth and who's lying, whether it's, it's politically, it's religiously, or morally? It's okay if you're in that spot. It's, it's easy to be there. In fact, I'm, I'm going to give you two examples. I'm going to show you two videos right now. They're, they're both um, on the political spectrum. And I want to be very clear here that in order to be a part of faith, you do not have to adhere to any political ideologies. You don't have to be a Republican or a Democrat or a Tea Partier. Is that what you call them? Okay. You don't have to do that. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. I'm not going to tell you uh, who you should or should not follow. Um, this is my truth. And what I mean by that, this is my experience. Um, I've traveled all over the world. I've been able to live uh, amongst the poor and the rich. I have friends that are are immigrants and refugees and and part of the minority groups. And what I've learned about both parties is this. Both are good and both are bad. Both have really good policies that if you dig deep, they're actually based on biblical principles. And both have really bad policies that are anti-biblical. If either party was true, they would speak the truth all the time. Not their truth, but the truth. And what we're about to see, I'm going to show you here, is that both parties like to lie. This first video I'm going to show you here is a Republican activist, Candace Owens. She's uh, called as a witness in a, uh, in a trial. And this is they, they, they try to undermine her... Uh, her integrity by taking her words out of context. Take a listen to this. Congressional hearings, the minority party gets to select its own witnesses. And of all the people that Republicans could have selected, they picked Candace Owens. I don't know Miss Owens. I'm not gonna characterize her. I'm gonna let her own words do the talking. So I'm gonna play for you the first 30 seconds of a statement she made about Adolf Hitler. I, I actually don't have any problems at all with the word nationalism. I think that it gets, uh, the definition gets poisoned um, by elitists that actually want globalism. Globalism is what I, what I don't want. So when you think about whenever we say nationalism, the first thing people think about, in, at least in America, is Hitler. You know, he was a national socialist. But if Hitler just wanted to make Germany great and have things run well, okay, fine. The problem is, is that he wanted, he had dreams outside. Of Germany. He wanted to globalize. He wanted everybody to be German, everybody to be speaking German. All right, so my uh, first question is to Ms. Hershenoff. Ms. Owen said, quote, if Hitler just wanted to make Germany great and have things run well, okay, fine. The problem is that he wanted, he had dreams outside of Germany. So when people try to legitimize Adolf Hitler, does that feed into white nationalist ideology? It does, Mr. Liu. I know that uh, Ms. Owens distanced herself from those comments later, but we expressed great concern over the original comments. 
Would you like time to respond to that? Yes, um, I think it's pretty apparent that uh, Mr. Liu believes that black people are stupid and will not uh, pursue the full clip in its entirety. He purposely presented an extract, an extracted witness, clip. The witness absent. will suspend for a moment. It is not proper to refer disparagingly or with, to a member of the committee. Uh, the witness will not do that again. Witness may continue. Sure, even though I was called despicable. Um, the witness may not refer to a member of the committee as stupid. I didn't refer to him as stupid. That's not what I said. That's not what I said at all. You, you didn't listen to what I said. May I continue? Please. As I said, he is assuming that black people will not go pursue the full two-hour clip. And he purposefully extracted, he cut off, and you didn't hear the question that was asked of me. He's trying to present as if I was launching a defense of Hitler in Germany, when in fact, the question that was asked of me was pertaining to whether or not I believed that Hitler was a, whether I, or not I believed in nationalism, and that nationalism was bad. And what I responded to was that I do not believe that we should be characterizing Hitler as a nationalist. He was a homicidal, psychopathic maniac that killed his own people. A nationalist would not kill their own people. That is exactly what I was referring to in the clip, and he purposely wanted to give you a cut up similar to what they do to Donald Trump to create a different narrative. That was unbelievably dishonest, and he did not allow me to respond to it, which is worrisome and should tell you a lot about where people are today in terms of trying to drum up narratives. By the way, I would like to also add that I work for Prager University, which is run by an Orthodox Jew, and a single Democrat showed up to the embassy opening in Jerusalem. I sat on a plane for 18 hours to make sure that I was there. I'm deeply offended by the insinuation of, of revealing that clip without the question that was asked of me. It's intense, right? This congressman takes something that she said, it's true that she said these words, but he took them out of context to make it into a different narrative, into a different truth, which is no truth at all. So this was a Democrat attacking a Republican. Now I wanna show you the other side of this, where um, back in the day, back in November when we had the riots, uh, Representative Barr, there was a hearing for him, and one of the congressmen, uh, Jim Jordan, put together this video showing some of the rioting that was going on and then he quotes multiple people as saying peaceful protests taking their words out of context as well uh, one note from us uh, about the hearing today at the beginning of the attorney general bar hearing at the house judiciary committee the ranking member of the committee republican congressman jim jordan of ohio played a video featuring many uh, upsetting images of mayhem and violence from protests and riots across the country. And that was included along with a mashup of members of the media uh, and others using the term peaceful protests. Peaceful protests. Peaceful protests. Peaceful protests. Peaceful protests. The, the motive was clearly to show members of the media, including many of my CNN colleagues, calling violent protests peaceful. But Congressman Jordan neglected to give the full context of these comments. So my team and I did it for him. Here, for example, is the full sentence of what CNN reporter Josh Campbell said. And this has been the epicenter where there have been largely peaceful protests during the day, at night, sometimes turning uh, violent with these confrontations between protesters and police. Here are the fuller context of the remarks of our correspondent, Diane Gallagher. This is something that we have been seeing here on the streets of Atlanta, mostly peaceful protests uh, since the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis. And when it was one of their own, that anger, that frustration, that pain simply exploded. And we saw the result of that to, overnight and into this morning uh, in those protests. Uh, again, for the most part, uh, throughout the entire day on Saturday, the protests after Rayshard Book's death were peaceful. And as it began to get dark, things began to change. So do you understand what, what Congressman Jordan and his team did there? Our reporters, Diane Gallagher and Josh Campbell, as you saw, accurately described the protests as peaceful and then often exploding into something else, including violence at night. But Congressman Jordan, you just quoted the part of what they said 
that said peaceful protest when that wasn't the full context. That's not what they said. They weren't calling violent protests peaceful. Congressman Jordan, you did a disservice to them. And more importantly, you did a disservice to the American people and you did a disservice to the truth. Congressman Jordan, you owe them and anyone else whose comments you completely misrepresented today on Capitol Hill, you owe them an apology. Any person of honor, any person who cares about the truth would do that. I guess we'll see what you're going to do. These are examples, and I know how many of you feel just uncomfortable because I did not want to show any of those today. <laughs> but here's the point. Anybody and everybody who is a human being can take the truth and manipulate it. They can take someone's words out of context, try to make a variation of the truth that is no truth at all. Which leads us back to that question, what is truth? If, if you look to the evening news or to the internet or, the, or to politics for your truth, you're always going to be wondering what's right and what's wrong. But if you look to Jesus, if you listen to his voice, you can be confident that what you hear is what you get. What you see is what you get. Every word he ever spoke has been fact-checked to the nth degree. And Jesus has come out squeaky clean unless people try to take his words out of context. But if you read them within the context, Jesus has never lied. And he declared throughout his ministry, I'm going to go to the cross to die for the sins of the world. And then three days later, I'm going to rise from the dead. And guess what? Year after year after year, what do we celebrate? Easter and Good Friday. We celebrate that Jesus Christ died on a cross and then he rose from the dead. King Jesus never lied. And King Jesus will never lie to you. He's never going to manipulate the truth. He's never going to take anyone's words out of context. And his truth, the truth, has the power to set you free. Today I hold before your eyes Jesus Christ. Like Pilate, you can be blinded and say, what is truth? Or you can stand before him as your king and recognize that everything he says is for your benefit. That no matter what's going on in your life, you know that he has a word for you found in the scriptures whether there's family troubles, whether you're going through interpersonal turmoil, whether you're going through depression, whether you're struggling with addiction, whatever it is, Jesus Christ can set you free. My prayer is that you see that and that you believe that. Let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You are our Savior and our friend. And Lord, I thank you that you reveal to us that there are times where we run after truth where, where there is no truth at all. Lord, yes, you want us to be good citizens within our nation. Yes, you want blessings upon our nation. But Lord, most importantly, you want us to be saved. You want all people to come to a knowledge of the truth. Lord, bring us to that point. Help us to share that truth with other people. Help us to influence the world through your kingdom that is not of this world but lives within our hearts. It's in your holy name we pray, amen.